What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I recently found out that the most infamous online retailer Timu now sells gaming PCs and some of them are ridiculously cheap. So I decided to pick one up that after a coupon cost under $300 all in and in today's video I'll be unboxing, benchmarking, and critiquing the system to try and answer the question of whether or not anyone should pick this cheap gaming PC up. Now obviously Timu is a pretty polarizing marketplace and we will be having a discussion of the ethics later in this video, but for now let's check out the listing I ended up purchasing. So after looking at all the different options on Timu, this one piqued my interest the most. It touted specs like an 8GB RX 580, Intel i7 processor, 16GB of RAM, and a 512GB SSD. It also seemed to include peripherals in the price, and it had a 5 star rating, which made me really curious. Now the price seems to bounce around a lot and at the time of purchase the price was $334 and after a coupon it brought the total cost down to $291 after tax and shipping. So I placed the order and waited, expecting it to be a couple weeks before the system showed up, but to my surprise less than a week later this big box showed up on my doorstep and of course it was delivered during a classic Florida downpour. After letting the box dry off overnight, I decided to open it up and was happy to see the system was double boxed. This adds a little extra protection physically, as well as more importantly makes the package more discreet and way less likely to be stolen from your porch versus a box that says gaming PC on the outside in bold font, which is actually how a lot of pre-builds are sent out. Opening up the actual PC box, I pulled out the included keyboard and mouse pad and was surprised to see some thick and high quality closed cell foam, which again wasn't something I was necessarily expecting on a system this cheap. I pulled the system out and while unboxing it found the mouse along with some paperwork. At first glance, the PC looked to have come in good condition with no damage from shipping. Pulling off the side panel, I found an accessory bag and some Instapack equivalent foam that expands to fill the gaps in the PC and works as great protection during shipping. I decide before taking a closer look at the internals or pulling off any of the plastic, I should make sure the system actually powers on and is working. The PC booted right up and while waiting for Windows to load up, I turned the RGB lights on with the included remote. Once Windows loaded in, I was able to go through the normal setup process and was brought into a pretty clean install of Windows 10 with no noticeable bloatware from what I could see. There were some Windows updates to do but the pre-installed graphics drivers were actually up to date. With updates done, I was basically ready to start testing but first let's pull off all the plastic to get a better look at this PC and the components inside of this $300 system. At first glance, this PC looks pretty solid, it's got nice RGB lights, a tempered glass side panel that's actually toolless, it also has a good sized tower cooler and black sleeve power supply cables. With that being said, once you look a little deeper at the specs themselves, you start to see why this PC is able to be so cheap. Under that tower cooler I just talked about isn't an i7 like the listing implies and is actually an Intel Xeon E5 2673V3. This is a 4 core 8 thread CPU that released 10 years ago and while I think this isn't okay for an ultra budget gaming PC, putting it in a system that's presented as new is a bit misleading in my opinion. With that being said, what really matters is how it performs in gaming which we'll find out in just a few minutes. This is sitting inside of this odd x99 board with 4 DIMM slots, an M.2 slot, a 16x PCIe slot for our GPU, and an extra 1x slot. This is the type of board that has exactly what the system needs and not much more which again is fine if it works well. Inside one of the DIMM slots on this motherboard is a single 16GB stick of DDR4 memory at 2666MHz. This is fine, dual channel would be preferable, but from my understanding Intel CPUs from this era weren't affected that heavily by RAM speed. 16GB should be more than enough for the system, and I mean theoretically you could pop in 3 more 16GB sticks for 64GB of RAM in the future. The SSD is actually a SATA one which sits in the power supply basement, it has 512GB of capacity and is nothing special, but it's certainly a lot better than a mechanical drive. 512GB of SSD storage is actually pretty solid in my opinion for a system at this price. The graphics card is an RX 588GB but it's actually the 2048SP version which performs more like an RX 578GB than a traditional RX 580. 
With that being said, this is the exact type of GPU I would go for if I was building a PC around this price point, as they're still very good for 1080p gaming when installed in a decent system. To power this PC, there is a 500 watt power supply which is branded with the pre-built manufacturer's logo slash name and doesn't have any rating listed. I'm willing to bet this is a pretty low end unit, but on the plus side, it does have all black sleeve cables which does keep the build looking clean. The case is this generic tempered glass case with a very restrictive front glass panel, power supply basement, and an adequate amount of filters. It also has three RGB fans that can be changed using the included controller. The case and RGB fans are probably the reason people will buy this thing as a lot of uninformed consumers equate RGB to high performance for some reason. Also, taking off the back panel, I found there to be decent cable management, not the best but also definitely not the worst. This listing advertises this PC as having built in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and what it really has is these two little USB dongles, one for Wi-Fi and one for Bluetooth, which these are generally pretty low performing. In terms of the included peripherals, the keyboard and mouse are both light up and both pretty low quality. The keyboard is a membrane board, which is fine I guess, but it is a large full size board which isn't great for gaming in my opinion. The mouse is a very basic one with no forward and back buttons or DPI adjustment like you'd find on basically all gaming mice. Also this does come with a light up trackpad that is way too small for FPS gaming in my opinion. With all this being said, these did come free in the box and would be more than enough to get someone up and running. So the real question is how does this system perform and is it worth it? Well let's answer the performance question first by showing off some benchmarks. I decided to test mostly popular esports titles with a few AAA games mixed in. The first game up is Valorant which I tested at 1080p low settings and by hopping into a deathmatch. Doing this resulted in a decent 202 FPS average with 1% lows of 107. This was smooth and enjoyable which is to be expected because Valorant is pretty easy to run. Next up is Apex Legends, which is actually a game that I haven't opened up in a couple years at this point, so I had no idea how it was going to perform. I decided to test at 1080p with most things set to low, and I was happy to see there's a team deathmatch mode now, as that would allow me to test during continuous action. Doing this resulted in a surprising 125 FPS average with 1% lows of 85. This both looked and felt very solid and I honestly don't remember Apex being this easy to run. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, I tested this at 1080p medium settings using the built in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 163 FPS average with 1% lows of 110, which I think is pretty good performance in Rainbow Six. Next up is Elden Ring which is a more difficult to run AAA game. I tested this at 1080p low settings and by trying to fight the Tree Sentinel. This is literally my first time playing Elden Ring so don't make fun of the bad gameplay but doing this resulted in a 43 FPS average with 1% lows of 31. This felt okay but I think with a game this difficult you really want a locked 60 FPS as dying to lag is not fun. With that being said, for you experienced Elden Ring players, let me know if you think this is enough performance or not. Moving on to Fortnite, this game continues to disappoint me performance wise. I tested at 1080p in a Team Rumbles match with performance mode enabled and ended up turning basically everything down to low. Doing this resulted in an okay 86 FPS average with abysmal 1% lows of 11. There was a fair bit of stuttering and lag and while I think this is okay for very casual play, I think you'd be at a severe disadvantage if you try to use this system for competitive play. Next up is Cyberpunk 2077 which I tested at 1080p low settings and by just driving around the city to see what kind of performance I would get. This resulted in a decent 49 FPS average with 1% lows of 27. This definitely wasn't ideal but for a single player game like this I think the performance was adequate and overall it was a relatively smooth experience. Finally I tested Minecraft with the settings you see on the screen right now. Doing this resulted in a few hundred FPS average but just like with Fortnite the 1% lows and stuttering were decently bad. I thought enabling vSync locking the FPS to 60 would help and while it did stay pretty stable while just running around, flying with an elytra again dropped the 1% lows to unbearable levels. I decided to also do a CPU only benchmark with this E5 Xeon to see how it performs. So I fired up Cinebench R23 and did both a multi-core and single core test which resulted in scores of 40-47 and 841 respectively to 
To put this in perspective, a more modern CPU like an i3-12100F actually performs more than twice as well in Cinebench R23 compared to this E5 Xeon. In terms of temps, both the CPU and GPU stayed under 70 degrees pretty much the entire time, and the noise from this machine wasn't too bad either. So now that you understand how this PC performs, let's talk about how much it would cost to build this PC yourself. Hopping onto eBay, we see the CPU is actually easily found for under $6. The cooler is probably worth a little bit more than the CPU at around $10. The motherboard's worth about $33. The 16GB RAM stick is worth about $16. The SSD's worth about $25. The GPU is worth about $80, the power supply is hard to price but I would say max around $30, and the case slash fans I would value at about $50. Adding this all up, it would cost you around $250 before peripherals and a Windows license, which after those would actually get close to that $300 price point. So this begs the question of whether or not I think this PC is worth it at $300. Well, even though it would cost you a similar amount to build the same PC, it's still pretty hard for me to recommend. In even a lot of esports titles, its performance is mid at best, and getting this PC means you'd be buying a system that was obsolete a few years ago. The biggest problem in my opinion is the CPU itself, as everything else spec and performance wise is somewhat okay. Because of this, I really don't think I can recommend this PC, and would honestly recommend either saving up more for a pre-built, or try and hunt deals on the used market where you should be able to build a better PC for the same price. With that done, let's talk about Timu itself as a platform. I'm not going to make a judgement on the ethics of Timu or whether or not you should buy from there, but I will link a few videos and articles in the description detailing the concerns that some people have with the platform. With that being said, I personally don't think Timu is ethically that much worse than a company like Amazon, but do think some of the allegations of data harvesting and theft are concerning and something that you should be aware of. With that being said, I'm interested to hear what you guys think of this PC and if you would consider picking one up. Let me know in the comments section below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a big thumbs up as well as consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.